A uh, brief apology, my voice is not very good this morning, um, so uh, Naomi at the back is going to have to help me out. Um, but let's pray as we come to God's Word. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we ask with the psalmist, please open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things in your Word. May we see the beauty and the glory of Christ as we study the new covenant this morning. We ask it in his name. Amen. Have you felt tension uh, these last few weeks as we've studied the old covenant, the covenants with Abraham, Moses, and David? We found a pattern as we've gone along. God has promised, I shall do these great things. I shall absolutely do them. But then we also found requirements for the people, circumcision, obedience to the law, the kings remaining faithful. How could God promise things and keep his word when there were also these conditions? And we found that the people couldn't keep these conditions. Week after week, we found this tension. God makes good promises, promises he assures us he will keep. But Israel, the people of God, they can't keep their end of the covenant. And so they couldn't really enjoy what had been promised. Instead, they experienced many of the covenant curses, ultimately being exiled from the land. And then last week, we heard the great promises of the new covenant. The Lord said, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And I will give you a new heart and they will all know me. On that point, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Truly knowing God is to have eternal life. And the new covenant promises, knowing God, new hearts, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. But don't you feel the tension? How can we be secured in these better promises of the new covenant when time and again we've seen mankind can't keep covenant with God? Surely only, only if someone keeps covenant. There's amazing promises. The new heart, forgiveness of sins and fellowship with God. Last week, Brian said, God made those promises unconditionally unbreakably. How can God promise these things for sure? The answer, only, only, only if someone keeps covenant with God on behalf of those who will receive these things that have been promised. And this is where the big picture of the Bible all starts to come together. If you were to open your Bible to the first chapter of the New Testament, you would meet the son of Abraham, the son of David, a man born under the law, the second Adam, and his name is Christ Jesus, and he comes as mediator, mediator of the new covenant to keep covenant with God on behalf of all his people. First, this morning, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. If we turn now to the scriptures we read um, just a few moments ago, Mark 14 verse 24, at the last supper, Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. It's Christ's blood that secures the covenant for many. He's the mediator, the representative in this new covenant. The writer of Hebrews explains, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. A covenant mediator is someone who represents all the members of that covenant. A covenant head, and Christ stands as head for all the members of the new covenant. And uniquely, Jesus is God incarnate. He, he can really represent God to us, and as a man, he can really represent us before God. We've had covenant heads before, haven't we? Adam, Abraham, and so on. But Christ is different. He comes from God to bring his people to God. What grace, what love for God himself to become our covenant heads, the guarantor of these promises to every one of his people. Friends, it's in this way that God both sets the terms of the covenant and keeps them. 
How can Christ's people, how can Christians here today be secured in these better promises of the new covenant? Only if someone keeps the covenant. And Christ, the God-man, he stands in as mediator. He must keep the covenant. This is the big story of the New Testament. Christ keeping covenant. And in doing so, he secures these amazing promises for his people throughout all the ages. But saying all this about Christ doesn't mean that these last seven weeks through the Old Testament have been a waste of time. We're about to see that the Old Covenant has in shadow form been painting a picture of how Christ will keep the New Covenant and secure blessing and eternal life for all his people because Christ is the one we've heard about every week. The one promised on the day of the fall, the serpent crusher, the seed of the woman, the ark, the one who will bring us through judgment, the offspring of Abraham, the faithful Israelite under the law of Moses, the king from David's line. Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. How? How does Christ keep covenant on behalf of his people? Well, throughout this series, we've often spoken of a requirement for righteousness. And we find that Christ fulfills all righteousness. Second this morning, Christ fulfills all righteousness. And to see this, we need to trace our way all all the way back to week one. We've just heard that eternal life is promised to members of the new covenant. When was the last time in our series that eternal life was promised to someone? It was in the covenant with Adam, wasn't it? The covenant of works in the Garden of Eden. And there, Adam had a task. If Adam obeyed, not eating from the tree, he would receive everlasting life. If he disobeyed eating the fruit, he would die. Now, we know Adam broke covenant. And so all in Adam, all of us here by nature, are shut out of the garden, guilty and spiritually dead. But Christ the mediator fulfills all righteousness. Christ is the obedient second Adam. And like Adam, Christ had a task. In John 10, Jesus says he will die for his people. He's speaking about his own life. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This commandment, I received from my Father. Like Adam, Christ had a task from his Father, a task to go to the cross and lay down his life. Adam's task was not to eat from a tree. Christ's task was to go to the tree to die. And like Adam, Christ's obedience was tested in a garden. Mark 14, 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane Garden. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And look at verse 35. Going a little farther, he he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. The hour was the cross where he would face almighty wrath for sin. The single hardest thing imaginable. The condemnation for millions upon millions of his people concentrated upon him there at his tree. Verse 36, he prayed, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. This was the most strenuous test of obedience possible. To knowingly choose to face countless hells for all his people. This is infinitely more strenuous than Adam's task. Verse 36. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Christ passed the test. He did his father's will. He willingly went to the cross. The second Adam succeeds where the first Adam failed, where all of us would fail. Just look at verse 37. He returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? His disciples, people like us, they weren't even able to do the very small thing of staying awake 
Friends, none of us can do righteousness to the extent that we deserve eternal life. But the good news for those disciples, those sleeping disciples that day, and for every disciple of Christ here today, is that at the very time Peter and his friends were asleep, Christ was completing the greater task for their salvation and for ours. Christ keeps covenant with his Father. And what reward for obedience Obedience to death, even death on a cross, well, Paul writes, therefore, because he did this, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Because Christ obediently went to the cross, he was raised, raised from the grave, ascended, glorified, and confirmed in blessed eternal life. And he does all this as mediator. So that just as death came to all through Adam, eternal life comes to all in Christ. Christ is the obedient second Adam, but there's more. Christ is the blameless seed of Abraham. Christ is the blameless seed of Abraham. This covenant with Uh, The covenant with Abraham had had put a requirement for righteousness. Abraham and his children were required to walk before God faithful and blameless. And the sign of that was circumcision. Friends, Christ, Christ, he is the truly faithful and blameless one. He, He circumcised, yes, outwardly, but also he was circumcised of heart. Every intention of the heart of Christ was to love God and glorify him always. Christ is the blameless one, the truly inwardly circumcised one. He's the blameless seed of Abraham, and he's the faithful Israelite. Paul writes, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Christ was born under the law of Moses, and yet he kept the law of Moses without blemish or defect. As he stood trial, Pilate confirmed the fact. He said, I find no basis for a charge against this man. See, the Israelites were to to keep God's law in order that they might dwell long in the land and know God's blessing. Christ, Christ was the one who never broke the law. Israel broke the law many times, so they did not always live under God's blessing and eventually were exiled. Christ, he never broke the law and therefore the land the blessing and the glory, it all belongs to him. More than that, under the law of Moses, there was the prophet, priest, and king. And Christ, he was the faithful priest. He represented his people perfectly because no sin of his own could stand in the way. And he was the true prophet, declaring, preaching God's word, and he was the king. Christ was the forever king. In Mark chapter 15, it said six times over, Mark 15, 2, 9, 12, 18, 26, and 32, the king of the Jews. And he was. He was born in the line of David. And as we heard in the Davidic covenant, the king was to represent the people before God, leading them in keeping God's law. And the king was to build a house for the Lord and inherit a forever kingdom, and friends, Christ did it. He did it all. He was the obedient king. He kept the law all his life, but he also completed the task his father gave him at the cross, and in doing so, Christ the king both proves himself obedient and builds the ultimate house of the Lord, the spiritual house. Bricks built together, people built together, the church with Christ the chief cornerstone. Christ the King built the house made up of all the saved citizens of his kingdom. All the righteousness requirements, everything the old covenant required, the mediator of the new covenant, Christ Jesus, completed He was blameless, circumcised of heart. He was faithful, always keeping the law. He was true king, building the ultimate house of the Lord, but he went further. As the second Adam, he completed the task his father gave him. Though he was tried 
and tested by Satan in the wilderness. And though he was tested in the garden, Christ faithfully went out from that place. And he went out to the cross. And in completing this unique task, Christ fulfilled the righteousness requirement that he and all his people in all ages might enjoy eternal life without any possibility for a fall ever again. Christ fulfilled all righteousness. But the tension hasn't been fully resolved, has it? Because over the weeks we've seen there are consequences. There are consequences for disobedience and and rebellion against God. And each one of us here, we've rebelled, we've disobeyed countless times. But Christ, he is the mediator of the new covenant. He's the all-sufficient mediator. Not only does he keep the righteousness requirements, he also faces the covenant penalty. That is, people deserve third this morning. Christ is cut off for sin, but not his own. Hopefully that phrase, cut off, echoes in your ears. Adam was cut off from Eden, breaking the old covenant meant being cut off from people, land, and God's presence. Christ, Christ was the second Adam, the blameless seed of Abraham, the faithful Israelite, and the forever king. And he, he was cut off. Let's start with his kingship. In the Davidic covenant we read, I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by man, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Christ did no wrong himself. But his people had. We have. And he stands as substitute, wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. The king was flogged, scourged and mocked. Mark 15, 26, the written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. It was as king, as mediator, representative of his people that Christ went to the cross and was punished for his people. He went as king. But he also went to the cross as faithful Israelite, born under the law, as the one who had fulfilled the law. And yet he was condemned under the law. Mark 14, 53, they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law, they came together. These are the authorities required to condemn someone under the law. And many false witnesses come forward. Caiaphas, the high priest, asks, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus replies, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And did you hear the verdict? As Brian read it, verse 64, they all condemned him as worthy of death. These are the people who could condemn you under the law and they condemned the innocent one under the law. Why? Why? when he was condemned for all the law-breaking of all his people. And as a condemned man, he was crucified. He was hung on a pole. In the Mosaic law, in the book of Deuteronomy, being hung on a pole was a picture of curse for lawbreakers. But Christians, the curse that he faced wasn't his. It was our curse, if you're a believer here. The sins you and I have committed even today. The sins we have committed, even while we've been in these four walls, the curse for these sins, for all our law-breaking, was prosecuted upon the condemned Christ. Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. The faithful is right, was cursed and condemned for all his people's law-breaking. 
And as a man under the curse of the law, Christ was cut off. He was cut off in judgment, cut off from the people. He was abandoned by his disciples. He was taken out of the city to the place where they burnt garbage and he was mocked and he reviled and uh, and crucified. And friends, now we're really standing on holy ground, aren't we? For there, according to his humanity, he was forsaken of God. According to his human nature, he was cut off under God's wrath. But not for his own sin. Mark fifteen thirty three, At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemak sabbathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The righteous one is cut off by God under wrath. How can that be? Well, only, only as he shoulders the curse and sin of all his people. And there at Calvary, he died. Death came to all man because Adam failed in the garden. But the second Adam, Christ Jesus, he came to die. And his death was actually the task that his father had given him to fulfill all righteousness and receive eternal life. And so, according to the will of God, as Christ is put to death as mediator for his people, he fulfills the task his father had given him to do. And as he does, he faced eternal death in the three hours of darkness. The death that you and I deserve. The death his father had given him to die. And then verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The cry, it is finished. This was the death of death for all his people. For in that moment, he had nailed the sins of his people to his cross. The sins of all his people, Old Testament believers looking ahead to him and New Testament believers the problems that we've encountered again and again in this series. Who's able to do righteousness in order to merit eternal life and who can save us from the penalty? They come together here at the cross. Christ completes this horrifying but amazing task his father gave him to do, to go to the tree of the cross for his people. And so there in that moment, he merits eternal life. He wins eternal life, not only for him, but for all the people he rescued. And at the very same moment... At the very same moment, he saves all his people from the penalty of their sin, disobedience, and unfaithfulness. He bears the curse of the covenant. He dies our death that we might live in him and live eternally. And friends, what clearer sign can there be that he really fulfilled all righteousness for eternal life and really succeeded in removing the penalty for all his people? What clearer sign can there be than his resurrection? Having completed the work his father gave him to do, he was vindicated. He was raised from the grave, exalted to the highest place, and one day he's coming coming to restore all things under himself and gather all his people, all those his Father has given him to his close presence forever. Have you felt the tension these last few weeks? How can we receive the better promises of the new covenant only if someone merits them? How can we escape the penalty of the covenant because we are lawbreakers? We're enemies of God. Now, praise God, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. 
and because of him. Because Christ fulfills the terms, completing the task his father gave him to do, and because Christ takes the penalty, the new covenant is unbreakable for all in Christ. Because our covenant head has done it. That all in him, all united to him by faith, might share in all the achievements that he has earned. The new covenant is the climax of the story of redemption. Long foreshadowed in the covenants that came before, but realized, inaugurated in Christ. And it's in this new covenant by faith that we are saved. Old Testament believers who had believed in the snake crusher, the seed of Abraham, the prophet better than Moses, who'd believed through the promises, types, and shadows, were saved this way, under the new covenant, through Christ's work. And New Testament believers, any of us who are trusting Christ here today and generations of people since his resurrection have been saved this way and saved eternally because of Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. It's all him. It's not from us. Praise God for Christ. Praise God for our mediator. We've got a few things left to consider. Let's title them like this. Responding, going under, coming up, and feasting. Fourth, lastly today, responding, going under, coming up, and feasting. First, responding. How can we receive Christ as our mediator? How can we stand under him as our covenant head? How can we stand secure in the new covenant? Well, by faith. And we see this immediately as Christ dies. Mark 15, 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's access to God into his close presence. Brian will speak more about that next week. And... And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. The centurion sees Christ giving up his life, fulfilling the task his father gave him to do, and he believes in Christ, calling him God. The centurion believes in the promised snake crusher. By faith, this man is saved. Christ is his mediator. He becomes a member of the new covenant. And by the way, he's a Gentile, not a Jew. Do you remember the seed of Abraham? Would bring, would bless all nations. It's fulfilled in Christ. And we are many nations here today, but the way to receive Christ as mediator and stand forgiven in the new covenant is the same. It's by faith. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Not faith in our good works, not faith in our Bible reading, not faith in anything else, faith in Christ. And even that faith is a gift from God that all the praise might go to him. And through that faith, we are united to Christ. And with Christ, we receive those new hearts by the Holy Spirit. Our sins are forgiven by his cross and resurrection. And we know God. And there's more. Because Christ is vindicated, raised, and eternally glorious, everyone united to him by faith will share in his great inheritance. More on that next week. I wonder if, as we've gone through these weeks, have you started to see all the threads of history coming together in Christ? If you have, if you've seen your need, if you've seen your guilt under Adam, under the law, will you come and receive Christ as your mediator? to do what you could never do, to fulfill righteousness and literally go to the cross because his father had told him to do and bear away the penalty for you and for many, many others. You can't earn this. It has to be Christ. But will you receive him? Will you put your life, your eternity, your everything simply into his hands? Will you respond? If you will, if you have, 
What about going under and coming up? Over the weeks, we've seen that covenants often come with signs. The rainbow, circumcision, the trees in the garden, and the new covenant has signs too. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these signs not only picture what Christ has done as mediator of the new covenant, they speak of our membership with Christ, of our covenant union with him by faith. Take baptism. Yes, it pictures Christ dying, going down into the grave and rising again, but it goes further. Paul writes, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Baptism is a, it's a visible demonstration of what's happened to believers. It's a visible demonstration of what's happened for the five we're baptizing today, for any of you who've been baptized. And under the new covenant, this is something Jesus commands. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In baptism, as we're about to see, you go under and you come up. Picturing death, burial, and resurrection with Christ. And picturing cleansing. We take a bath when we're dirty, don't we, to wash off the dirt. And having Christ as mediator, it means you're washed clean spiritually. Baptism is a visible picture of what's going on in the new covenant and of who we are in Christ. That we're united to him. That's what's true of him becomes true for us. That we're united to him. We've, we've died to the old way of living under the first Adam. And with Christ, the second Adam, we're alive. We're part of his new creation. Responding, going under, coming up, and feasting. The other sign of the new covenant is the Lord's Supper, communion. And Jesus instituted this on the night of his death, Mark 14, 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. The bread and the wine, they symbolize Christ's work at the cross, his body given for us, cut off, broken for his people, and his blood shed and poured out like wine. But of course, the Lord's Supper, we eat it, don't we? We drink it. With normal food, we eat bread and drink water to live. Receiving bread and water is essential to our life. And so it is in the new covenant. In order to receive life, we must receive Christ. We come with empty hands. All we can bring is sin and brokenness. But Christ provides. He provides himself. And receiving him, we may live. And this is what the Lord's Supper pictures to him. Just as we eat to live, we need to receive Christ to live. I won't say much more, but the Lord's Supper also points us forward. It points us beyond the simple table we have today to the final destination for all Christ people. Mark 14, 25, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The new covenant blessings we've spoken about today culminate in eternal life where all Christ's people feast forever in the place of the glorious presence of God. The supper points to that. One day, if you're in Christ, if he's your mediator, you will take your place at his table and you shall feast with him. Friends, baptism and the Lord's Supper, they're not optional extras for the, for the Christian. This is new covenant existence. First, to believe on Christ, to be united to him by faith. Second, to go under in baptism, showing we've died with him, that our old self has died with him, that we're seeking to die to our sin. Third, to come up, to come out of the waters into membership of his church, showing that we're united 
with him in resurrection and united with all the people in all generations who he died to save. If you're a Christian here today and you've not been baptized or you're not a member of a local church, you're disobeying Christ. You're missing out on these precious signs, these means of grace within the new covenant. Responding, going under, coming up, and then feasting at the Lord's table. Christian, every Lord's Supper is a preaching of the gospel to us, for we never graduate from this gospel. It was in Christ alone that we were saved. Christ alone today and every day. It's always Christ alone. And we will be praising Christ alone when we take our place at the feasting table on high on that great day. We will be praising on that day the mediator of the new covenant. For in him alone and by his amazing grace and love we may receive new hearts, enjoy forgiveness of sins, know God and glorify him throughout this life and eternal life ahead. May we all be found in Christ that day. May we all be found in Christ that day. Amen.